Welcome to another episode. I am V and this is the Sussex Set. Yes, welcome back. Uh, This is your post-funeral podcast. So there were a couple of things that happened before the funeral. Uh, So before, during, and after that I haven't had the chance to remark on. Uh, But today is September 27th at the time of recording this podcast. And Variety, not too long ago, posted an exclusive about uh, archetypes. So archetypes will be back on October 4th. They took a three-week break uh, for mourning of the queen. Even though official mourning was complete yesterday, the 26th, in part, their statement stated that they wanted to just have an additional week after getting back from England, which I totally understand. Um, Just to have with their kids, assuming that they weren't with their kids the full time. Truthfully, we don't know, but God, I hope not. Um, I thought it, it... in the beginning, I thought, wow, that's a long time to be, you know, without their kids. And I hope that they bring them over, even if they don't, you know, have any public appearances. Uh, but in hindsight, if they stayed in California, good for them. But uh, I definitely understand needing just to debrief from all of that uh, in England. So Archetypes will be back October 4th. That's next Tuesday. And assuming... Nobody else in that god awful family dies. Uh, we will, they will resume with the weekly episodes on Tuesdays. Uh, to my knowledge, they were pre recorded, but being who they are, I'm sure there are calls and interview requests and all kinds of requests to field uh, every week that an episode is out, even if Megan doesn't do anything, you know. So I definitely understand just wanting to delay that for a week. And I mean, by do anything, I mean, like, you know, when the Mariah episode came out, when the Serena episode came out, Megan didn't get any interviews about it or make any appearances. It was just, you know, people promoting the podcast, uh, which is actually nice. Um, But before even just wanting to think about all of that, I understand delaying it for a week. So at least we have a date. Because to be honest, that was giving me a little anxiety. I was thinking, God, we don't have an episode today. So what does that mean? Are they going to do the full six weeks? Because a lot of people were throwing that number around. And then I'm like, please don't. (laughs) Please don't. Not for this family that didn't even bother to truly protect you uh, when they should have. They protected Andrew, but they didn't protect Harry and Megan, or their children. So uh, thankfully, they are going to go ahead and resume. And uh, we know, we found out when Megan, went after the queen died, because of the cancellations um, that Megan was going to do Jimmy Fallon, I believe, during the, the General Assembly week of the UN. Uh, she was also going to do a couple, like one other thing. I can't remember what it was, but... Maybe that'll be back on. Certainly she can go on whenever she wants to, but I just can't imagine. And this is what I'm going to get into first. Um, But I just can't imagine her mind state coming back to America after the funeral versus what it would have been coming back from just the Well Child Awards, which is what was the original plan. But anyway, Archetype is coming back. And then I also just briefly wanted to hit on um, really two other things. So the memoirs, Harry's memoirs. I heard they were delayed. I saw different articles saying that they were delayed. Of course, the British media and tabloids are going to spin it however they feel it makes the royal family look better. Uh, Harry, for example, Harry's doing a uh, rushed rewrite because he realizes now the era of his ways and why he needs to really um, get in good with the new king. Okay, girl. And you know this how. Uh, And then I also have been seeing January or February thrown around as a delayed release date. But then I keep seeing people talking about November, you know, so which was like, I think November or the holiday season was the original slated release date. But obviously, and understandably, there should be chapters about the queen given her passing, especially given that the book is not even published yet. So there that prevents the need for any rewrites after publishing. 
either way, though, I don't believe the book will be all quote unquote tell all. Harry has lived a life prior to Megan, prior to being a husband and a father. He's had a full military career. But even with that, folks are still afraid of that memoir, right? And only now they're using the queen's death as just another thing that they can try to hit uh, Harry over the head with. And there are still folks calling for him to call off the memoir or the book deal because he has a three book deal with his publisher. That's absurd. And it's the fact that they think that they can get him to do that, which is, kind of goes to show how they've always regarded Harry in my opinion but even with the life that he's lived before Megan and I was talking to somebody on Twitter about this Harry's most important chapter in his life will always be as a husband and as a father those two chapters in his life I'm not talking about chapters in the book I'm sure it'll span plenty of chapters but those two chapters Becoming a husband, then becoming a father are the are the sections of the book which the royal family is afraid of. And they call it, they keep calling it a tell-all, which he's not given any indication that that's what the intention of the book is. But there's a fear that he will actually tell what happened in those chapters, at least in terms of when he was still there. Except for the most recent years, the time of him becoming a husband, the time of him becoming a father to his firstborn, that entire time had a huge cloud hanging over it because simultaneously his wife was in the darkest place she's ever been. His family, for lack of a better word, was the most sinister toward him than they have ever been and I can't imagine you know how when you think back to certain parts of your life um, even if they were joyful but then something really traumatic also happened around that time you cannot get that out of your head and so imagine him becoming a dad those memories are coupled with memories of just before becoming a dad his wife being suicidal He has to talk about that. And really, he doesn't. But I don't see how he doesn't. And that is the that is the the genuine fear. So whenever the book comes out, I think there's just going to be so much going on really leading up to the book, whether it's the new year or the end of this year before the holiday season, uh, that whenever it comes out, it's going to feel like, wow, the book is already here because the crown will be out. Uh, Obviously, everybody will be busy during Christmas season. And then at the turn of the new year, they're still going to be afraid of the memoir until it until it hits. You know, so I don't care when it comes out. I know I'm going to buy it. I'm probably going to buy the audio book as well. And I want to hear Harry's take on his life because everybody seems to have an opinion about his life, what he should do, what he should have done what path he should take, who she, who he should marry, all of these things. I want to hear his take on his own life. You know, like that's the least that everybody can do is just wait to see what he has to say about his own life, whatever he chooses to share within those pages. So he has a brilliant ghostwriter. In fact, there's a whole movie about the guy, J.R. Moringer. I think I saw it on Amazon Prime and Ben Affleck plays his uncle. Yeah, I mean, check it out. I mean, it's interesting enough, but the book is going to be a bestseller, just straight up right off the top. Uh, And that is also another big fear. I'm pretty sure, you know, the family, the press and all of the critics have. Um, But, you know, it is what it is. The book's coming out sooner or later and it'll be ready when it's ready. Something else is coming out soon. Later this autumn is The Crown, season five of The Crown. And already, (laughs) already we see the English royals led by Charles. And he is trying to get ahead of the season debut. And you know what I find so funny? None of the royals had any beef with The Crown. 
when it was good watching for them. When it showed the monarchy in a good light, when they could just talk about Churchill and Elizabeth's dad and young Elizabeth coming into, you know, power and JFK and Jackie O and all these other dead people. It was great. You know, it was great marketing for the royal family, free marketing for the royal family. In fact, season one, great. Season two, great. They, it was well documented that the family watched and loved The Crown, even season three. But see, season four, and if I could just refresh your memory, there's one dead person that they never wanted to hear from again, and her name is Diana Spencer. Lady Di, the Princess of Wales. They did not want to see her life. They didn't want to see any <laughs> redramatization of those moments because they know that's when it really starts to reflect badly on the royal family and not just the royal family, but the queen. And oh, oh, oh of course, Charles as well, who is now the king. But remember season four? When they tried to get, you know, Netflix to say before all of their episodes, this is fiction, as if we didn't know. It is fiction, but girl, it's historical fiction. A lot of those things happen, (laughs) you know. Uh, So I think they are so afraid of having folks look at them for who they truly are that they assume and wrongly assume that folks can't differentiate between what is embellished and what is simply fact. You know, dramatizations and historical fact can coexist in one show. We understand the argument might not be word for word, but we do know that there were disagreements in some quite heavy disagreements within that marriage, for example, but also within the marriage of Philip and Elizabeth. Speaking of which, in season five, Philip's, quote, close friend will also (laughs) be in this season. And so that's going to ruffle some feathers for sure. But I believe if you if you remember season four, it had uh, Margaret Thatcher. You know, she was one of the um pretty much the primary opposite of the queen, whereas uh, Diana was primarily opposite of Charles. And then Camilla was right there as a third will, because really when you watch that season, she really is the third person in that relationship. Diana said it. There were three of us in this marriage. Girl, season five is going to be a barn burner. Season four ended with all of the family at Sandringham Diana is trying to save her marriage. Charles is trying to end the marriage. They're both trying to, you know, speak to the queen and talk about, you know, the problems that they're having and why everything has come to a head. And probably one of the most haunting scenes is when Philip enters Diana's room. Everybody else is downstairs. She clearly doesn't want to go down and be around the family. She's already sort of like an outcast within the family. And she says, this family is going to have to start showing me uh, the love that I deserve or else I'm going to have to go find it on my own. I'm going to have to officially leave and find it on my own. And then Philip says, I wouldn't do that if I were you. I don't see it turning out well for you. And then she says, is that a threat? That's how season four ended. Now, that conversation may or may not have happened. However, after Diana divorced, the, she did not live for two years beyond that. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not saying nobody did nothing and, you know, truthfully somebody, but I'm not saying I'm not. I'm just saying I don't know. And she did fear for her safety, but she feared that family in a way, but she didn't want to be, she loved her husband. You know what I mean? She didn't want to be divorced either. Uh, But she also was not going to just be in a marriage where she wasn't loved. And so 
the last episode of that season ends with a close up shot on her face. And it's almost like she's come to the conclusion that she was just done with the whole royal shebang in terms of being married into that family. And well, she was done in real life after that trip to Sandringham. You know what I mean? So there are many things that the show gets right. They have plenty of folks informing uh, on the show. They have uh, plenty of historians informing the writers of the show. There's plenty that that show gets right. And they wouldn't be filming season six if the show was historically incorrect and sloppily done. So I think Charles is just going to have to sit through season five and uh you know I think season five is going to be the the season where Diana passes away and I think the last season season six will be just sort of like the last season to show that we are currently in the present era of the royal family Uh, because they already you know had put out a casting call for you know actors to play skull and bones so listen the crown it's an incredible show if you haven't watched it i recommend it highly but charles it's just so funny to me that he and the royal family just doesn't realize that making such a stink about the show is only going to bring more eyes to the show it's only going to bring more receipts out (laughs) <laughs> in the public domain um, for all folks to see and f- folks will decide for themselves, you know, but it's just wild how he insults the intelligence of the average person. And it's just wild that he thinks that because he is king and, you know, he gets his way that he can somehow demand certain disclosures before um, a show that he has nothing to do with. But, That is actually very similar to what they've done with the BBC. So anytime anyone talks about Princess Diana now, there or or make reference to that Panorama interview, and this is where I find William to be so sick, um, because this is what he did to his own mother. Anytime anybody makes any reference, like documentarian type reference to Diana and references that Panorama interview, they have to put legally now just as a way of you know full disclosure saying well the BBC has since stated that they will no longer air this interview and that it was um, filmed under dubious circumstances or whatever the language is for example if you have HBO Max there's a documentary called The Princess which it's just a documentary but it's no interviews it's so unique in that it's only just clips of Diana's life first as a pre-royal or pre um, Princess of Wales as Princess of Wales and post Princess of Wales until finally her her death And then at the very end, at the end of the credits is the whole thing with the BBC and how the BBC said, this is all within the last year. William has made a couple of speeches about it, basically gaslighting his dead mother. Uh, But Diana still said what she said and she meant what she said during that interview. So, and she wanted to do the interview is the thing. So it's all kinds of fuckery coming from the Royal family at all times when it comes to the memory of Diana And the only difference between Diana and Harry and Meghan is that Harry and Meghan are alive. And Harry and Meghan can control their own narrative um, because, you know, they have many, uh, many resources with which to do that. Um, It's really insane stuff. So I really recommend, (laughs) I recommend The Crown just because I like the show. I, I love Olivia Coleman's portrayal of the queen. I love Gillian Anderson's portrayal of Margaret Thatcher. Season four is by far my favorite, but um, never forget that the royal family always shows who they truly are when the heat is on. Well, the heat's coming back on November 9th 
And again, the memoir is going to be somewhere around that time or at least a few months afterwards. Uh, so that's going to be another thing. And you already see how they be acting about Megan's podcast and all she's doing is talking to other people. Um, so why y'all, why y'all protesting so much? (laughs) Anyway, let me rewind just a little bit. Um, one of the things I didn't get to talk about that I wanted to really hit on and hear me out here, but ultimately just how unfair The events surrounding the Queen's death and immediately following the Queen's death was unfair to Harry and Meghan and to Meghan in particular, to both of them. But in some on some days, it was just just downright terrible for Meghan. And as I heard someone put it, really the most perfect way that you could put it, their trip to Europe, where they went to the One Young World Awards, they went to Dusseldorf for the Invictus Games, came back to, you know, England probably for a day of rest or something, and then we're going to do the World Child Awards. A four-day trip turned into a 17-day nightmare. That is truly unfair. And I think we take for granted that Megan was thrust into a dark space. And she was forced back into an emotional environment that defines the darkest chapter of her life. Like for real. And it really seemed like emotionally the powers that be conspired to put her back in an emotional environment so triggering that at one point previously she wanted to end her life. See, but like the cruelest thing in that is that they used the queen's death to do it. Like, do you know how sick you have to be to do that? This is why I say sinister. You have to be so dark of a soul. And that's the thing. The monarchy has no soul. It's made up of a bunch of people who feels like it's their job just to keep it going. And no one person can be blamed for any terrible thing that happens to any one individual. But they thought that the queen's death... A queen, a 96-year-old woman who had COVID twice. I believe they thought that the death of this old lady would cause the world to collapse on Harry and Meghan's head. Now, I did speak previously about this on the podcast, but the rumors and reports, for example, that Meghan had to be set down and told, you know, how dare you think you can come to Balmoral and, you know, be around the family as the queen dies. When the queen died, the biggest articles on any tabloid website, on any of their front pages for at least a day or two was Megan. Think about that. Then in tandem, the press wrote story after story, giving the Karens that keep them in business, the red meat that they wanted And I believe they thought that this would cause a tidal wave of hatred that would paralyze Megan. And right, it goes back to this idea that they wanted her trapped when she was there. They wanted her trapped. And then just this week, there was this clip around uh, Twitter that's just been going around Twitter where Diana is talking about in that same interview, that Panorama interview, that the best way to dismantle a personality is to isolate it again Megan didn't plan to be there for no damn 17 days but she was there this was just a day or two after the queen died but she knew she wasn't going anywhere for a while they had her trapped the way they had her trapped when she was originally over there and isolated now they had her trapped at least for the near future because the queen's died and there's no way she's going to leave the island when the queen's not even in the ground yet So they thought, okay, this is our moment. We're going to paralyze her. We're going to make the world hate her so much that there's no way that she can recover from this. But what they didn't account for was the rest of the world also seeing what they were doing in real time. See, because Megan's first stint in the country, even though it was her darkest, it prepared the rest of the world for what they were witnessing. And I'm not even talking about Harry and Megan supporters. 
I'm talking about just regular everyday folks who were mildly curious about England and what happens when the queen dies. They saw this woman being mistreated, tormented, actually. So when people saw it, they knew what it was. And they were all appalled, disgusted, and it backfired. But all the while, when it's happening to you, you probably don't get that feedback in real time, maybe upon review. But if you're Megan, you're still in this really dark place. You're already feeling really bad for your husband who lost his grandmother. You're also grieving because you knew the queen personally. But then you also have these security concerns that don't go away just because the queen dies. So this entire time that they were over there, I'm trying to think of it from Megan's point of view. And just days before we saw the look of absolute fear and anxiety on this poor woman's face during the whole quote unquote fab for walkabout, um, she was light. She was smiling. She was engaging with folks who were happy to see her. Um, Folks who are accustomed to Megan just going out and being herself and being comfortable and supporting her husband and his endeavors and him doing the same thing. To see that contrast just days apart and knowing exactly why it flipped like that, because by the way, it wasn't because the queen died. It was because people are racist and they want to harm this woman. But because the queen died and they had to be in place in this country for the next, you know, seven to 10 days, things did shift for them seismically, really on every level. And because these motherfuckers take 12 days to bury the body of a monarch, Megan could not go back home where her children were and leave like she planned to do. <laughs> she planned to leave on the ninth, I'm assuming. Well, because the queen died on the eighth, she couldn't. They were stuck in England, trapped, and had to endure all that that entails, that mourning and grieving process. And just so happened that, you know, it played out before the world's eyes. And I, I take it back to what Megan said in that cut article the cut profile. None of it had to be this way. Megan was the only person, I would say Harry and Megan, because they, they tried to um, mistreat him in front of the world as well with the whole uniform thing, which I, I am going to talk about in a moment. But like, none of it had to be this way. You know, she's going to sh get shit from the press. But it's the way that the family treated her. There's so many photos and receipts just from the funeral. But obviously leading up to the funeral as well, that demonstrate how nasty those people are. And we're talking about the family. None of it had to be that way. But y'all wanted it that way because you wanted her to realize, you wanted her to not forget that she is just not welcome here from the way Sophie was scowling to, you know, the picture of, they call it the three witches where Megan is just standing there in dignity because one thing about my bitch is she's going to be dignified. And she was. History will smile on that. But the way they isolated her, that's their thing. To the way that, you know, the pettiness of, the royal family and Charles, he won't even acknowledge any titles for Archie and Lily, which I personally don't care about. But the acknowledgement of new titles on that line of succession list that we see, but not new titles relative to the George V Convention, where the children and grandchildren of the monarch are automatically uh, titled prince and princess. You know what I'm saying? Shit like that. Imagine having to be around that for 12 days. Really longer. But 12 days. 
officially. I was astounded at the way they so brazenly treated Harry and Meghan as if their feelings didn't matter, but in front of the world, right? And not a care in the world about it. And it's the lies that they as a family, they as an institution tell that they don't even believe. And this is not me even deliberately trying to beat up on the family or Will or Charles, but they are vile. (laughs) They are vile. Like there's no other way to look at it. They're vile in the way that they adhere to their duplicity. On the one hand, it's Charles saying, We love Harry and Meghan and we support the life that they're building in the United States. Or William, when the cameras are rolling, trying to engage or show that he's engaging with Harry and Meghan, again, for the camera. But on the other hand, they're setting up traps for both Harry and Meghan and leaking to the royal reporters during and after Harry and Meghan's stay and continuing to lie on this woman around this trip to Balmoral. Because that story took so many flips and turns, I don't even know what version they settled on. Because if you notice between the walkabout and the whole Balmoral fiasco, Charles's house and William's house, those houses were at each other's throats trying to get out their versions of both of those stories. Now, I don't even read that crap, but even if I did, I wouldn't know what's the truth and what's the lie. And now imagine being at the center of all of that and instantly being reminded of any number of lies that have been told about you by these same sons of bitches. When I tell you they have never given this woman a break, it's... William and Kate saying that they're so excited for Harry's, you know, new start as a husband. He's gotten engaged. We love him. We support him. While also plotting against this woman with her fucking father to prevent the wedding from happening in the first place. It's we love Megan while also dictating to this woman at her wedding causing her to cry and then not saying anything to correct the record for years when the story was told that she bullied Kate instead of Kate bullying Megan. It's Megan going to the institution and the HR department for help when she's feeling suicidal. And by the way, some reporters knew this and they, they didn't write about it. They didn't say anything. But the institution also was silent, turning their backs to her. But then while also saying Harry and Meghan will always be loved members of the royal family. It's allowing lie after lie after lie to be told about this woman in the daily papers. While also telling her that she is too highly visible to please stay in the house for four fucking months straight. Again, isolation, duplicity, absolute torment. The English royal family is no place for anyone who actually respects themselves. Then there was the whole fiasco with the uniform. At about the third or fourth day of mourning, after the queen's death, uh, it got out that Harry would not be permitted to wear his uniform. Now, when this initially came out, it was Harry wouldn't be able to wear his uniform at the funeral. And it was couched as, quote, only working royals can, despite the fact that Andrew hasn't been a working royal for literally years now. He's been stripped of his titles, um, his royal patronages, and... People said, what? (laughs) People literally were like, huh? So wait, if Prince Harry can't wear the uniform because he's not a working royal, why is Andrew permitted? And we know that there are always those who agree with any punishment 
levied on Harry. And the same people will gladly ignore any concessions given to Andrew, even though he is an actual predator. But enough people were outraged and critical, and we're talking about just within the UK, critical that they're trying to punish Harry, that Charles really changed the game plan real quick. Like, So again, it was Harry couldn't wear the uniform to the funeral, but Andrew can. And if you notice on the day of the funeral, neither of them were wearing the uniform. See, but then Harry very smartly released a statement saying, in part, my uniform doesn't define my military service. And that was brilliant because then that draws further distinction between his service and everybody else's service. And that's going to be a losing matchup, really, because then the press has to go and pull out all of Prince Harry's military, you know, photos and all the stories and things of his military career. And um, that just makes people enduring to the guy. And that's not what y'all want, right? Harry is a 10-year combat veteran who ascended to the rank of major, not just captain. They called him Captain Wales, but he was a major. So they came up with this plan to let Harry wear the uniform to honor the queen as his commander-in-chief. They basically came up with a visual, the first of its kind, and they... That was the one where Harry could wear his uniform called the Grandchildren's Vigil. I don't know if that's the official name, but that's what everybody was calling it. And to be honest, it was it was actually solemn and sadder than the Vigil of the Princes, the one where the Queen's children held vigil for 15 minutes. Andrew, too, was permitted to wear his military uniform at that vigil where the children stood vigil, uh, I believe it was a day before the grandchildren's vigil at Westminster Hall when the queen was lying in state. To me, that just said, okay, well, here, we'll let Prince Harry wear his uniform and we'll let Andrew wear his uniform. They're, They're equal. They both served in the military and they both got to wear their uniform for the queen. In other words, a quick cop out. Good job, Charles. You're starting off your reign like an absolute moron. But they realize how bad it looked. It it makes no sense to allow Prince Harry, who most recently served, by the way, two tours in Afghanistan to not allow him to wear wear his uniform uh, to honor the queen. But it was when Harry put that uniform on that me and a lot of you guys really almost anybody with eyes realize why they didn't want him wearing that uniform because he wears it better than everybody else. He wears it better. And it's not because he has a nice physique, although that doesn't hurt. He just simply is a military man. He wears it more confidently than anyone else because he knows he's earned the medals that he wears on that uniform. The man told you himself, the uniform does not define my service. And the way he walked in that uniform was a perfect demonstration of that. Like, it's not a competition, but if it were, 10, 10, 10 across the board for good King Harry, you feel me? And speaking of good King Harry, why was that trending right after when he wore the uniform? For days, in fact. Right? Y'all try to take away from what he has earned, take away the things that he has earned. And then y'all embellish all these other fools around, around Harry and Meghan because they pale in comparison. Like, for example, Mike Tindall, when he, wasn't he recently talking about how uh, he was getting trolled for wearing his Jubilee medals, which I guess were given to him by the queen because, you know, he was married to one of her grandkids uh, at one of the times of one of her jubilees, but like, girl, okay, good. That's basically the equivalent of a participation award. You didn't earn nothing for that. But now he embarrassed. But when you look at somebody like Harry, what he got is what he earned. He might have some jubilee awards as well, but he don't need them because he's going to have enough of them that he's earned himself. Now, it is said that Harry was 
upset, which we, we haven't verified this. I Whether he was upset or not, I probably would be hurt, but specifically by the fact that the ER symbol or emblem that goes on his right shoulder is supposed to anyway, uh, was not there. So that was another petty slight by the Royal family. But Andrew had his, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, on his uniform. And Harry was a combat veteran. Maybe Harry was hurt by that. Maybe he wasn't. But I know one thing is for sure. He shouldn't have been surprised uh, because his family is who they are. And that is just not something that you accidentally forget. And I know Harry knows that. So even in allowing him to wear the uniform, they find a way to twist the knife just a little bit more, just to remind him of what they think of him, right? And mind you, these are things that the average person just would not know or would not even know to look for. But Harry knows and they know he knows. And so that was a big F you to Harry. But it's one that he is not going to forget. But it didn't stop him from holding his head up high. And again, there was a clear distinction between Harry and Will. And then when you look at Harry in uniform compared to all of the rest of them for the entire morning period in uniform, Harry is the only one who wears that uniform and it didn't look like costuming. Imagine that. But what I love is that they tried to hurt him. But at every turn in this debacle, he gained more and more support and respect. Without the uniform, he looked like a king. With the uniform, he put the rest of the girls to shame. Baby boy could not lose. And even though he is also grieving, it seems like Harry just had the attitude of, you can't hurt me no matter what you do. You can't hurt me. And I'll take it even further. They can't hurt Harry, but he can still hurt them. Harry knows, they know, and they know that Harry knows. And the memoir may or may not be paused for now, but rest assured, you just gave him a whole lot of new material for a few more chapters. You can't hurt him. Oh, but he can hurt you. He can, Harry can really do some damage to the monarchy. Harry can do more damage to the monarchy than the monarchy can do to him, to any one individual. But Harry has already said on many, many occasions, if you only knew the things that I knew, he's not lying. He is not lying. And so Harry never has to wear that uniform again. He's going to be good because when you go from feeling trapped to feeling empowered, there's nothing you can do to that person. And then of course there were other moments of, I call it bullying, um, moments where the Royal family deliberately in coordination with the press, I feel tried to humiliate Harry and Meghan. There was the inviting and then uninviting them to the state dinner. And girl, if you're going to do that, at least make the picture that you release from the state dinner sickening. I saw the picture and nobody in the picture looked like they wanted to be there. But there was that and then these recurring bullying allegations that they keep making against Megan. Like they seem to come with new shades every single time Megan is either in or around England or really just living and breathing. Like they keep popping up. Like, so-and-so is writing this book. Oh, another journalist is writing this book. Oh, here's an article and here's a source saying what their experience was when they worked with Harry and Meghan. Nobody is ever named. And it's always shrouded in certain phrases. And I've talked about this on the podcast before. It is understood that. It is believed that. One source said, a friend of the Sussexes said, just say you're making it up. But you can't do that, right? But no matter how people try to bully Harry and Meghan, millions of people will still choose to support them because of who they have demonstrated themselves to be. Just like there is no title, no rise in rank that will make people like me, right, see the royal family different to what they have demonstrated, especially in September of 2022. 
lying, bullying, scheming, power grabbing, hypocritical, trash people. I mean, think about it. We witnessed the sloppiest transition from the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge to then becoming the Prince and Princess of Wales. That was the sloppiest changeover imaginable. And I'm really just talking about on the public facing accounts. It was the way that it was the day that the queen died (laughs) that Will and Kate changed their bio from the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge to the Duke and Duchess of Cornwall and Cambridge. And then when Charles announced them as the Prince and Princess of Wales, did they delete all of that and then just change it to the Prince and Princess of Wales? Because that's really what they were waiting on. And listen, if that's how it goes, then that's just how it goes. But damn, like give Charles and Camilla a chance or at least their whoever works for them to change their bio first, right? But out of respect for the queen, they didn't do that. But see, that just goes to show you, at least for me, just how hungry William has been. And I think there's a lot of William and Kate, to be honest, but truly William, because he will be the one that holds the quote unquote power, whatever power they got, love girl. But like, it shows you just how eager they are. When if you ask me, Harry and Meghan are just quietly grieving in their space because it's not about the titles for them because they have created titles for themselves elsewhere, which the others simply cannot relate to. But even if they could, the queen's body was probably not even cold yet. Not to be, you know, macabre, but like, girl, we know you're naturally gonna be the princess of Wales. Like, we know you're gonna be the prince of Wales. Like, whatever some folks in Wales think about it, whatever their, you know, their opinions, which, you know, I learned a lot in that. I didn't realize why the king's heir was named the prince of Wales and his wife named the princess of Wales, but I know now. And if I was Welsh, I probably would have some type of feelings about it too but it doesn't change the facts of the day girl we know but it's just the way that they don't care how sloppily that was done and how it looks on the outside to me that is a central character flaw but it revealed again it revealed a lot in that moment and really once I saw that that's where I was just like okay so Y'all are really going to need to watch Will and Kate, not just during the funeral. We saw some things, but to be honest, I think Charles was the worst, but I think Will, Will was definitely, you know, trying it with the whole text thing and the stories that came out out of that. But I really wasn't worried about that. Like, but going forward though, watch the moves that they make, because that's going to reveal a lot. That's going to reveal a lot about the previous three years that Megan was in the royal family living in England. It's going to tell us a lot. It's going to connect a lot of dots because the, the thing is when a person who has power, and to be honest, Will ain't really got no power. He ain't going to you know, have no power until he's king, but he will have definitely more access, more resources with the Duchy of Cornwall and you know, technically that's his birthright. Fine. Girl, we don't care. But like, watch what he does with it. That's going to reveal a lot about some of the strings that were moving behind the scenes. So certainly with Harry's book, that's going to collect connect a lot of dots, hopefully. Um, but just wait. Because see, when people who shouldn't have power because they can't wait to demonstrate that power actually get that power, then... They reveal themselves without even trying to. Charles is a good example, right? Because we see the petty game he's playing. But probably the most readily (laughs) available example that we all uh, witnessed probably (laughs) in the last couple of years of our lives is Donald motherfucking Trump. That motherfucker was a maniac. So that's a little extreme of an example 
But you saw what he did with his power. He thought he was a king, you know? So um, I just thank God that Harry and Meghan are not living in that country, that they got out of that country before coronavirus. Corona hadn't even taken over the world at that point that they left, but it just so happened that they were on this side of the Atlantic once it did. Um, Because I can't imagine Harry and Meghan being trapped in that scenario with their children. Because you also... I don't know if you guys did, but I know I have gotten the sense, even just in the last two weeks since the the queen died, I've gotten the sense that the tabloids are even more eager to please whichever one they're lining up behind. Some people are lining up behind Charles because he is king. Some people are lining up behind Will because he's the next king. And you will still see Charles's house and Will's house going back and forth. Right. But they've gotten even more close. Right. That invisible contract has gotten stronger. Harry and Meghan were were not going to survive in that situation. Just look at the last two weeks that they've been there. And thank goodness we live in a time where Harry and Meghan or other royals who've left the royal fold are not beholden to the royal family. They live in a time where they can really go build their own lives and still do the work that they set out to do. And the thing is, people love to call Harry and Meghan the new Wallace and Edward. If this were a time where it was acceptable to be racist, it was acceptable to be just outwardly xenophobic, um, Meghan and Harry probably would be in the category of Wallace and Edward if they didn't have the opportunities that the, that they currently have, Right. Um, but the world has changed since then. Harry and Meghan have opportunities that some folks in the royal family don't even have. Opportunities that they've created for themselves, right? But it was a lack of opportunities, those types of opportunities, at least in their day, uh, that made Wallace and Edward irrelevant. There was nothing for them to do, <laughs> other than sit in the house all day or like be leisurely, right? And then also royals were far more powerful then at controlling the narrative than they are now. But there's no amount of wishing that Harry and Meghan were as irrelevant as Wallace and Edward that is going to actually make that true. And honestly, when Diana divorced and left the royal fold, they said the same thing about her. But Harry and Meghan have something that not even Diana had, and that is social media and eyes on the situation. And not eyes on the situation told to you by tabloids, eyes on the situation as it's happening in real time. That means the people get to decide for themselves, including how relevant or irrelevant a person is to them. And that's the thing that the royal family cannot figure out. They can't square with the fact that people don't hate Harry and Meghan because they said that you should hate Harry and Meghan. They can't understand why. Despite all of their efforts, why people continue to love them, why people continue to love Diana. Despite all of their efforts to vilify her, people boo-hooed at that woman's funeral who, by the way, should still be alive today. And then again, we talked about Charles and the crown. This is also why he's throwing a tantrum now that the crown is circling back around again, because he can't, he can't change people's opinions and control the narrative the way they were so easily able to do when she was alive. And what comes with Harry and Meghan's freedom, which should have also come with Diana's freedom, are opportunities of a new era beyond this antiquated institution, even though they're trying their hardest to copy and paste what they see. Um, I just saw an article about, uh, again, another royal reporter's book talking about Harry and Meghan. Uh, Meghan's arrival made Will and Kate, you know, 
realize that they need to get their act together. Girl, we saw that when, when the video happened, like the video of them doing the heads together uh, thing on stage. I'll link it in the, in the notes, but Megan rain circles around all of them. Every last one of them in terms of her confidence, her assurance, her eagerness, her energy. And there were still some things going on. It's just so funny to watch some of those older videos when you know now what was happening then it is still amazing to see just how she still put her best foot forward but how uncomfortable Will and Kate were on the stage with her because they knew they were being smoked and it wasn't even really a competition right but we knew that we knew that back then and so that's circling around now and so while they try to hit Megan over the head Even if she's not there, her presence, even if just for a moment, gave them new life because it highlighted what they were not doing. And they're still not really doing anything. They're just pretending to, right? But for the people who want to buy whatever they're selling, it looks better than what they were doing before. And that's thanks to Megan. And that's Megan and Harry together. But those opportunities that Harry and Megan now have outside of the Royal Institution, documentaries that they can executive produce, uh, book deals. And if they want to get back on social media, they can do that. Megan said in the cut that she's getting back on Instagram, magazines, centerfolds, and interviews. None of these things falling under the control of the British media or the English royal family. And this is a key difference. Because to an extent, Diana's image was still largely shaped by the British tabloid media and their coverage of her life and whatever she was doing. But she was right on the cusp of living her true life. And that's what's so sad about it, because when she died, she was younger than Harry is now. And Meghan is three years older than Harry. She was younger than all of her sons and daughters-in-law. So... She should have been able to do some of the things that Harry and Meghan are doing, whatever that meant for her day, whatever that meant for the 90s. But with Harry and Meghan, especially at this point in the story, there's no greater impact that the British tabloid media or the royal family can have on their lives that they haven't already made. And this is why they are going so hard at Harry and Meghan now. They've cried wolf too many times. I mean, really think about it. They have cried wolf too many times. They've told the same lies a few too many different ways that the world outside of England has just stopped listening. To the rest of the world, it just sounds like noise. Racist noise. And they've called them irrelevant a few too many times. I mean, and that goes back to the Wallace and everything. And it's so funny to me because it started even before they got married. Megan, a divorcee. Oh my God, is this a new Wallace? She's American too. They continued through the first year and a half that Harry and Megan were married. They were called irrelevant three months after they married and said they were going to move off into the country and fade into obscurity. And when that didn't happen, that's when the smears begin. They were called irrelevant when Charles talked about his new slim down monarchy when the queen was still alive. And then they got evidence to the contrary that Harry and Meghan were actually not irrelevant and people were still interested. So they bullied them even harder and leaked more to the press. And then Harry and Meghan left and they were really called irrelevant then because they were no longer in England to be in the royal family. And then people said, oh, well, we didn't need them anyway. They'll never be king and queen. But wait, then the fam and the press saw that the deals were rolling on in and it didn't take very long either. And now we see those deals actually playing out in front of us. Megan's got her podcast. People are tuning in by the millions. She unseats the number one podcast, Joe Rogan, who had held that spot for two and a half years. Consecutive weeks at number one. And Megan comes in. First day, she's number one globally, including in countries like the U.S. and U.K. Well, the U.K. is not a country. I get it. I know. But still in the U.K. But so you mean to tell me in the U.K. and really all around the Commonwealth, 
including number one in Canada, including number one in Australia, but the UK? The UK, number one? I thought you guys said that she was irrelevant. Y'all said she was irrelevant. But here she is, number one in your country too. And the tabloid girls can't wait to talk about it. I mean, they they the ones that made it number one. They listen it over and over and over. And she's doing profiles in American magazines like The Cut. And I believe on that day, um, a certain tabloid wrote 20 articles about Megan, like just Megan. She'll never be irrelevant. She'll never be irrelevant because y'all won't ignore her. It's like y'all want to ignore her. Y'all want her to go away. Y'all want her to be non-existent. But she's out here living. She's out here living her life and doing her thing. But you just can't take it. Harry is the same. You treat him as if he was a nobody who didn't serve in an active war for your country. But in America, he's still respected by the top brass and will continue to be. That doesn't sound irrelevant to me. Fast forward to now. The queen dies. Harry and Meghan are called irrelevant again because they didn't get new titles with that fresh death. And again, not to be macabre, but that's the way the rest of the royals treated it. The queen was freshly dead and they had new titles to come with it. They were gleeful. Especially looking at Will and his wife and Charles and his wife. Eventually, Harry and Meghan looked like the only ones who were actually grieving. But yet on the walkabout where Meghan, it's like every bone in her body was saying, turn around. She looked like a deer in headlights. People still showed her love. You, and that genuine love that you see from young women who are in her presence. And Megan has a natural warmth that just comes out of her when she's interacting with people. People still want to see them. People still want to hear what they have to say, especially young people. They have demonstrated their work ethic, both in England and the U.S., and wherever their endeavors take them. They're of high public interest, and they always have been. Unlike the Faleses, unlike the King and the Queen, but just like the previous prince and princess of Wales, Will and Kate are stuck in a lifeless marriage. And Kate has already told y'all she ain't gonna work no harder. Oh, but she will work hard digging through the queen's jewels with no thought to how it actually looks. And she will try to compare where she doesn't really compete in areas of fashion or beauty or what have you. But like, what does that really get the monarchy? I mean, y'all know how I feel about Kate. <laughs> y'all know how I feel about Will. Um, but again, it was the the title grabbing. Oh, I'm the new Princess of Wales. And yes, you are. But listen, Diana did 400 engagements a year. Are you giving that? And, then, and she was also in a loveless marriage. But she still cared about the people. See, that's the part that you're missing. And again, in that Panorama interview, she said, well, somebody has to go out there and love people. That's the key difference. That is the key difference when it comes to, and we're, we're talking about like the popular ones, because women do tend to be the popular people in the family because they are beautiful. They do wear fashion and they, they go out and people like looking at them. But Megan is more sort of in line with Diana's spirit. Kate was someone who wanted to be exactly where she is, but without having to do the work without having to actually do the work that you're supposed to do. Everybody's talking about the queen's duty and service to the people. Well, girl, your country needs you. Your country needs you more than ever now. For real. For real. They need you, girl. They starving. They have one less day to eat as well because, you know, the food banks was closed when the queen was buried. So, like... You going to have to actually work and that's for Will and Kate. But I know Will's going to have a whole lot more on his plate, whether he wants to or not. Because he's the blood royal. But I mean, Princess of Wales, pretty big shoes to fill. 
But it's the way, the thing that annoys me the most about any of that, again, it's the way that the press points to her and says, see, she does no wrong. But if I was a monarchist, I'd be fucking pissed. Because you need to be out here working. Like Britney said, girl, you better work, bitch. Like, because if you want to wear the crown, if you want to make it there, you got to take us. Like, it's on you. But in her in their statement, they were like, oh, well, you know, I'm just going to do what I've been doing and <laughs> good luck. Yeah, doing what I've been doing, which is to say nothing. But hey, that ain't that ain't my bag. But I digress. So what do they have now? A monarchy that will come to be defined by a cantankerous old man who doesn't even squeeze toothpaste on his own toothbrush in the morning. He doesn't. Charles doesn't. He doesn't. He just doesn't. They're left with an institution that treats a pedophile member better than the members who could have brought the monarchy into a modern age for a new generation of supposed admirers. Those admirers have their eyes focused on Harry and Meghan's projects now. Deservedly so. They're left with Will, Kate, and their kids and not a care in the world from the average person who is not a royalist or monarchist. And even just today, we saw a little uh, tidbit. Someone said that George told one of his classmates, you better watch out. My dad's going to be king one day. Isn't that charming? And kids are going to be kids, you know, but I can't say he doesn't get it honestly. You have country after country in the Commonwealth realm announcing that they will begin the process of removing the king as head of state. Just as Barbados did most recently. And and not like one or two. And there's only 15 countries where the king is head of state. So gone are the glory days. Gone is the unearned global interest and respect. I've said it once and I'll say it again. Continuing to bully Harry and Meghan, especially as has been done of late, is not a winning strategy. It makes the monarchy and their partners in the press look weak petty and unfocused on larger issues that affect millions of people in their scope of influence. And adhering to a strategy of triviality and pettiness only highlights why Harry and Meghan left in the first place. The one thing Charles and the Cambridges actually had going for them was the fact that the queen was alive. Now that she's gone, those new titles will only bring more scrutiny to them. And after a while, even Harry and Meghan's worst critics will get tired of hearing the same criticisms of Harry and Meghan. And simultaneously, the Sussexes' presence will further highlight the uselessness of the English counterparts. They are non-subsidized. They highlight others. They amplify other people's voices in meaningful ways. They provide solutions. So the others think they are competing with Harry and Meghan, but just wait they'll see that it was never a competition. So when all the hit pieces are written, when all the books have been published, when all the shows have aired, what they will be left with is a rumble among their subjects far and wide. And those subjects will be wondering why their precious tax dollars have to fund do-nothing royals who want you to believe that they are better than everyone else that they deserve to live in palaces and fly around in helicopters just because they can while their children starve. Even just this week, Pound Sterling fell off a cliff. And for the first time in my life, it's basically even with the U.S. dollar, give or take a pence or two. And I got to tell you, that was shocking even for me because the last time I was in London... My little U.S. dollars didn't go nowhere, nowhere, honey. Girl, I I felt broke. Well, basically, it's the same now. And I read an article that said that means food is going to get even more expensive and things are just going to continue to spiral downward. Because y'all are y'all are post Brexit. Y'all rely on other countries to bring in goods. Brexit only made that worse more costly and the European Union don't want you back (laughs) 
I mean, I feel for y'all, but like, that's a tough situation to be in. And to be honest, it's unbelievable to me as an American. Um, and now your currency can't even hardly compete, at least for the time being. So as I see it in that environment, with that landscape, it will be the leftover royals fighting for their lives. It is the monarchy who truly needs relevance to survive. And maybe that's why they throw that word irrelevance around so much. Classic projection. In a globalized world where their subjects abroad are embarrassed and their subjects at home are hungry, they are without a doubt in for the fight of their lives. Especially now that they are without their beloved queen. Harry and Meghan, on the other hand, are in the United States of America with their kids. Peaceful under a tree every damn day. Now bully that, beloved. See if you can bully that. Going forward, my hopes for Harry and Meghan in regards to their future, I just jotted down a list of things. I'm just going to rattle off real quick. In no particular order. I know there's a lot of talk about titles and the kids. None of it matters. Charles wants to will those titles. It doesn't hold the power he think it does. I hope Harry and Meghan continue on their path as a family with their philanthropy as if the queen had not died. Now, the queen's death does change quite a few things, but it also frees them. I hope that they continue to build their relationships, deepen their roots, and expand their businesses. The Heart of Invictus, which is a documentary that is supposed to come out on Netflix next year, that's still on the table, and that is going to... Uh, as my understanding of it was between the two Invictus games, the one that was in The Hague this year and the one in Dusseldorf next year is going to follow some of those athletes on their way to the 2023 Invictus games. That documentary is still slated for Netflix. I hope we see that. There is no shortage of opportunities for them here or abroad. I think Megan should be proud of herself for the way that she handled herself while in that country, among that family for the past couple of weeks. I think Harry should be proud. They both held their heads up high and they are a model for their children. Megan said that she will talk when she is ready and they thought they were afraid after reading the cut. Well, they should really be afraid now. They should really be afraid now. They deserve to be in a space where their heads can be clear and where they don't have to live in fear. I think that they will always have people supporting their projects as well as their right to privacy. Even though some of their critics can be really loud, they have far more supporters than not. And I also believe that Harry and Meghan should both say as little or as much as they want, as often as they want, because the world will be right there to listen. And I think if anything, this trip, even though it didn't end the way that they planned or it didn't end the way that it started, this trip should have confirmed so much for Harry and Meghan. I know it confirmed a lot for me, but it's not like anything that happened to them actually surprised me or really any of their supporters. But I think it should have confirmed a lot for Harry and Meghan. And it's it's so astounding the way that the tabloids are still peddling like the idea of Harry and Meghan reconciling. And I'm not against reconciliation that might actually surprise some of you guys but I'm just not for them making fools of themselves I'm not for them letting snakes because I feel like they're snakes really take advantage of them and weasel in right to ruin this thing that they they built um but this should have confirmed a lot you know how sometimes you move away from uh, certain people or certain people are not in your life. And then for a brief moment, they're back in your life. And you realize, see, this is why you're not in my life in the first place. This should have been that type of confirmation because again, they used an old lady's funeral, even though she was a queen, she wasn't just any old, old lady. But because it was in front of the world, 
they tried to destroy them. So I hope this was confirmation of sorts for them that clarified for them how exactly how they should move forward in their relationship with the royal family, whether there is a relationship, you know, to be salvaged or not. So whatever conclusion they came to after this trip, I have a feeling it is rock solid. But in the last episode, I did ask for you to send me your thoughts, your hope for the future, your um, predictions for the future near or further down the line and what you hoped uh, to see out of this whole situation because it's really been a saga for the last three years. I did get two recordings and because it was only two of them, I'm going to post the majority of what they sent in. And thank you so much for that brilliant commentary. I did have to edit it down just a little bit for time, but thank you so much for taking the time. I believe this week has largely indicated a turning point, um, not just in regards to the perception of Meghan and Harry, but in the perception of the monarchy at large. And it's provided a very rude awakening for the royal family and their fans. Liz's death occurred at kind of a peak moment for the Sussexes' popularity and reach and recognition of them as public figures. And seeing the Sussexes' reception at Dusseldorf, Meghan's speech at One Young World, and I think for all their moaning and mourning about the death of their monarch, they were not so conspicuously excited to use this death as an opportunity to knock the Sussexes down a peg. They were thrilled to have Meghan and Harry trapped by duty on that island for a week. I think they saw this as an opportunity to repeat the dynamics of the past and really to put the Sussexes back in 2018, 2019. And I saw someone on Twitter say, I'm paraphrasing here, but something like, up until now, it's really been a niche group of Sussex supporters battling with extremist royalists. And, you know, the squad has done an amazing job at correcting the narrative with limited resources and limited reach. But now the world is paying attention. A lot of people might not know or care about Meghan and Harry's story, but they know a little something about Diana. When people hear Harry clearly and calmly articulate those similarities and say they're not going to stop till she dies, people are getting it. The royalists exist in like a delusional echo chamber and now attention is being paid by a global audience. The doors to that chamber are being yanked off the hinges. For example, if you're a royalist, you can use measures like royal protocol because for her to break protocol is a classifiable offense. It's a reason to deem her unworthy of her position as Harry's wife. But you don't realize to the rest of the world, none of that means anything. None of that is real. So people who normally wouldn't care about the Sussexes are seeing just how deranged these trolls are when they call Megan every name in the book for holding her husband's hand at a memorial for his grandmother. And they're saying, well, seems like the protocol itself is inhumane. Maybe the protocol itself should be changed. And if protocol can be changed, what else? I think finally royalists are having to contend with the fact that every justification for their hatred of Meghan is based on the idea that this white supremacist institution is valid and that it must be protected and preserved to operate as it always has. And they're now being faced with a truth that we've all been known, which is that the institution does not carry weight on a global scale, that its legacy is overwhelmingly one of harm. And I mean, we all saw the celebratory (laughs) responses to the Queen's death, which I don't think any any royalist or the royal family predicted. In the year 2022, that institution is either going to need to change and adjust to the way that societies are progressing and follow suit, or they just won't last. And we talk a lot about how if the royal family weren't deluded by privilege and position and a false sense of their own permanence, they would have understood that inviting Megan into their firm would have been 
excellent opportunity for good PR and to slap a veneer of progress onto their archaic industry, that she would have done wonders for their longevity, but they squandered it. And now they're going to pay the price. And I think about something you said on another episode, V, which is that the royal family have nothing to show for their evil. And I think that's really apt because in a moment where they're being watched, their top priority is still to suppress the Sussexes, to demean Harry and Meghan in order to try and make themselves look better. It's a flop strategy. The Sussexes are going to shine no matter what you try to pull. When the royal family tries to draw a distinction between Meghan and Harry and the rest of them, they don't seem to understand that the difference is clear, but that they are the ones that look inferior. This is a transitional moment. The death of a monarch will inevitably raise questions about whether a monarchy is still necessary. And I won't go as far to say there's unrest in the UK, um, but it certainly seems that there's dissent. Closing food banks and canceling cancer screenings during the mourning period, taking $9 million from the British taxpayer for the funeral. These mandates, not only are they ridiculous, but they have to be ultimately damaging evidence that the monarchy does not serve the purpose it pretends to, which is to support the people over which they rule. My name is Ladarius. I am in Los Angeles, California. I am a royalist, been studying royal history for 25 years now. I'm a huge fan of the monarchy. My feelings towards the monarchy have changed over the last couple of years seeing the way the Duchess of Sussex has been treated by the media. And while I thought Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II was so interesting and such a phenomenal, she had such a phenomenal reign, sometimes I can't help myself but to blame her for not just putting her foot down and stopping a lot of the mistreatment and abuse that the Duchess of Sussex and the Duke of Sussex experienced. Um, I know the Queen had so many other things to focus on, so I'll give her the benefit of the doubt, but I do feel a way, if I'm being honest. What I wanted to talk to you and the rest of the Sussex squad about is reconciliation. I've been really thinking about that lately, and Let's say the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, King Charles and Camilla, the Prince and Princess of Wales all sat in the room. They cried, they hashed everything out. They all decided to forgive each other for whatever part they played in this um, very public family feud. And they decided that they wanted to move forward with a renewed relationship. What about the Sussex squad? What about us? How do we feel? Are we gonna continue to drag the Prince and Princess of Wales through the dirt? Are we gonna continue to drag his his and her majesty through the dirt? And I know the other side, same question. Prince and Princesses of Wales, I'm sure they have their own version of the Sussex squad on Twitter spewing Megan hate? Are they going to put down their swords and banners and allow for this family to heal? That's just a concern of mine is that this, that we may be contributing to a perpetual psych, a perpetual experience for this family. That We make so much noise that it's hard for them to focus on healing and moving on. So that's what I want to know. It's how do we feel about reconciliation? What would it take for us to stop going so hard for the Sussex squad? What would it take for us to feel like the other side has finally got it? Would it need to be public? Would it need to be specific? 
How do we feel? I'm very curious. Thank you to Ladarius and Kai. And if you would like to send a voice memo and give your thoughts on the subject, you can do so at sussexsquad at gmail.com. Please try to keep it between one to two minutes. Tell us your name and where you're from. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts. But thank you so much for listening to me ramble yet again. (laughs) Uh, And as always, y'all can find me on Twitter at Megan Mood. You can find me on TikTok at Sussex Mood. On Instagram, I think it's Sussex Set. I can't even hardly really keep up. Uh, You can find all of my links in the comments. Uh, But until we meet again, keep shining your light. And take care of yourselves and take care of each other. And so until next time, peace. I'm a bad bitch. You can't kill me. Kill me.